Dear ladies and gentlemen, hello and welcome to the 2022 International Open Seminar on Semiotics, a tribute to John Billy on the fifth anniversary of his passing. This seminar is a collaborative international open scientific initiative and a celebration that connects a network of dozens of organizations and scholars around the world. The sessions will run throughout all the year, so please follow the schedule on our website to stay tuned. And uh, today we are joining to explore intuition in Perth and Maritan, and our lecturer today will be uh, Donna, Dr. Donna West, which is a great uh, honor and pleasure for us. Thank you very much, Dr. West, for being uh, today with us. Uh, please allow me to say a few words uh, in order to introduce you to our public. Uh, Dr. Donna West is a professor of linguistics at the State University of New York, Portland. For nearly 40 years, she has presented and published internationally more than 70 articles and uh, book chapters on versus semiotics. She currently serves on the board of the International Association for Cognitive uh, Semiotics, as well as on uh, several editorial boards. Her 2013 uh, book, um, Dietic Imaginings, Semiosis at Work and at Play, investigates the ontogeny of indexical signs. Her 2016 edited volume on Peirce's concept of habit offers a fresh global per perspective and reunites the work of scholars from 12 nations. Dr. West is likewise editing the mathematics and cognition section for a handbook on cognitive mathematics uh, and uh, her own contributions there and uh, contributions explores uh, the uh, formidable role of ch chunking in abductive rationality. Uh, following the 2021 uh, publication of uh, two guest edited journal issues on birth and uh, consciousness in uh, cognitive semiotics and in semiotica, her forthcoming book presents uh, retrospective narratives as the scaffold towards Peirce's uh, retroductive logic. Thank you very much again, Dr. West. Uh, please, the floor is yours. The host has spotlighted your video forever. Thank you, first of all, for the um, privilege, really, of being. I don't know that I could ever be a vicar for uh, John Dealey, um, but uh, some of these concepts uh, have been have their origins in some of John's works. Um, but. Uh, Again, I'm going to do uh, my absolute best to um, compare uh, some of Peirce's work on um, the issue of um, instinct and so forth um, with Mary Tan's work on <clears throat> how to um, come to a, an eidetic visualization and um, what the differences might be between them. And I just want to make a, a comment about uh, Jacques Maritain uh, that um, I know that he's very dear to the hearts of um, uh, John Dealey and, uh, and Brooke um, and his wife. And um, I, um, I have received some interesting materials which are really not uh, purviewed today uh, but from Brooke, uh, in fact, regarding uh, Jacques Maritain and uh, some of their interactions. Um, so uh, what I'd like to do first is, and I'm not going to uh, put up um, a document for this, uh, is just ground 
uh, what um, I'm going to present essentially uh, regarding a purse. From um, Fernando Abdick to everyone, colon, is it near as the sound coming out in a mangled way since the beginning? Really? Okay. <laughs> I hope not. Uh, can, can everyone hear me then, or is it choppy? No, it's good, Dr. Okay, West. Very good. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, so um, uh, in terms of um, uh, intuition, at the very outset of his uh, career in 1868, uh, Peirce, and, and I'm not going to flash that on the screen, but um, uh, someone's interested, and many of you know, that he uh, repudiated the issue of intuition. And um, from uh, Tom Shorts and from uh, Gava's uh, perspectives and from my own, um, that later on- Antonio uh, Martins has joined the meeting. Is, um, he, he, um, it, 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 the reason that he repudiated it is because he couldn't really fit uh, index into his scheme of logic, essentially. And so because its uh, index is so momentary uh, in, in time, really, and in space, um, it couldn't be, from his perspective initially, associated with um, anything. And then when he reformed his notion of index beginning in 1885, uh, the notion of index um, took on as much as possible the value of intuition because of its sudden instinctual um, nature and because it could, in fact, illumine, you refer to illumine natural, um, the um, uh, features of secondness and bring features of secondness into uh, a logical scheme for the interpreter. And so the mind of the interpreter with respect to uh, index and index's role to take the context and make that context, um, I won't use the word real, but uh, make it um, so that there were some meanings um, uh, is, is a really critical Thing And so what I'm going to do, and I'm not going to show this on the screen because I think it can be distracting, is read from 5.53, and that is CP, of course, 5.53, um, and um, it's in 1903, okay, to uh, put together the issue of it, it doesn't really mention index, but it refers to secondness and the notion of um, uh, vividness and, and so forth and percepts and how uh, they uh, accentuate issues of secondness. And so here we go. Um, examine the percept in the particular case, a uh, marked case in which it comes to us or comes as a surprise. At that moment, uh, and, and I'm, I'm presuming in this case, uh, because it would be uh, an index, it's momentary, it's in space and time, uh, as, as in a hexaity, um, it, um, when uh, it comes to us as a surprise, the vividness of the representation is exalted, okay? And so, um, and, and the reason when it comes to us as a surprise, and then I, I have an ellipsis here, but something quite different comes instead. I say- Ruth uh, has left the meeting. The, um, this uh, is a, um, it, the, ins the, the instinct, the instant in which it, the surprise uh, comes to us uh, is 
uh, I, I ask you whether the, when it comes to, I'm sorry, uh, it is not a double consciousness. And so it results in what we thought before and this intuition, which comes to us as, as a surprise and the vividness is exalted. Um, on the one hand of an ego, uh, which simply um, is the, um, the expected idea suddenly broken off. And on the other hand, uh, as a non-ego, and again, this is the form of double, double consciousness, uh, which uh, is the strange intruder, um, which uh, he um, uh, mentions is an, an abrupt comes as an abrupt entrance, and so the issue of um, index as um, a possible um, uh, um, sign, which in fact uh, is an intuition for Purse. Uh, certainly, it it is. Um, a sign which indicates uh, an individual. So on that level, it, it can actually be a singular and not a general. And in addition to that, it is um, momentary. So on these levels, Leo Cave says join the meeting. intuition and index have those same characteristics of being momentary um, and, uh, and, and, and so forth. And so uh, there's uh, one other um, that I want to read with respect to index, and that is again in 1903, 4.447 CP, of course, for those of you who don't know. An index is a real thing or fact uh, which is a sign of its object by virtue of its being uh, connected with it um, and um, by, as a matter of fact, and uh, I would say by virtue, and also by forcibly um, in, in, in stanch or in, uh, intruding into, onto the conscious mind. And so in that it intrudes onto the conscious mind, um, it can be thought to elicit um, a, um, an, an, uh, in, um, a um, I'm sorry about this, um, an um, in, um, in, in intuition. Okay, so um, to, Compare that to Maritain. What I'm going to do now is show a table, this is table 1.1, 1 .1, uh, which is a comparison. Select the window or an application that you want to share. Basic. Um, purse and Maritain. So for purse, uh, I have the, the uh, an instinctual, an instinct. Um, Sharing options list box, you will stop. And um, participants can now. Okay, good. Um, and then I have the Illumin Natural um, Secondness, which is critical in terms of um, providing a two sided consciousness. Uh, so it functions Video frame w not just on the level of, um, of, of physical objects, but also on the level of instinct that is. Uh, some sudden um, notion or concept, if you will. Although Peirce does say, as I said in 1868, that uh, before he grappled with the issue of, of, of index and, and, and reformed his notions of index um, and fitted in to his logical system, um, he ha had the notion that it, it, it index, uh, he said, an intuition is a cognition, um, but it's a, a premise uh, without a conclusion. And so essentially, um, that's 
that's uh, what he did. Now from Maritain, um, at the outset, what I did is I have four, unfortunately more than three, <laughs> um, categories um, of objects, like between objects and then between uh, known and known, which is the mind of the individual and also the objects striking the mind and um, between some other, um, uh, between uh, individuals and, and so forth. Um, and so uh, what I'd like to do, I think I'm on the wrong table here, one moment, um, is, um, one moment, sorry. Okay, so I, I have it, sorry. Um, so, and then the fourth category is the promise of sign. So what I would like to um, make, make the claim um, that Maritain, uh, if you look, is um, actually, uh, uh, he's, he's thought of as a, um, um, a um, he, his uh, phenomenology is focused on, uh, and he's, he's thought of as a, as a mystic. And while I'm not disputing that altogether, um, I think underlyingly, uh, I'm going to show that um, he is in fact uh, a semiotician, and not just uh, not, not not just in accordance to um, uh, well, kind of a, a person semiotician. Okay, so the, there there is meaning um, infused within. So in 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 Maritain, he refers to uh, seizing the object. Um, and conforming the object um, uh, and taking the object in and conforming to it so that uh, this may be better placed in the next category. And so um, the, um, the, um, uh, the, the notion of conforming to the object is something uh, we're going to talk and about. And open seminar on Microsoft Word. Okay. Um, that um, it, it isn't a form of consciousness. It's actually considered to be a, a spiritual experience. And the spiritual experience um, is uh, eventually, I think, actually, um, it, it, uh, the, the knowledge of um, the knowledge of um, uh, I'm sorry, I have a, a bird over here that's acting up. I'm sorry about that. Um, okay. So um, the, the issue of transcendental uh, thought is that um, there's also, um, with Maritain, a suddenness, uh, a suddenness from the soul's own being and uh, the knowledge of being um, is consonant and uh, with the issue of grace and with the issue of um, uh, the type of grace that occurs um, very quickly. Um, and uh, so I'm going to actually at this point um, defer to, you can take a look at the table, but uh, I'm going to defer to what, um, how does one, from Maritain's perspective, prepare for the state of eidetic visualization? And this is, again, preparatory to intuitions. Um, and so two of the points, and I have three points, and two of the points, um, one of them is extracted by um, Maritain from Bergson. Um, uh, and, one, and another is extracted from Heidegger. And the last he took, not entirely, uh, because he, he modified it from 
uh, Gabrielle Marcel or Marcel. Um, and so uh, what, what does preparing for an intuition involve for Maritain? And there are three points. One is duration, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Another is anguish, and a third is fidelity. And so um, duration from uh, Bergson's and Maritain's perspective is living movement that's deeper than consciousness. So it isn't just this conscious movement, but this um, living um, movement of um, objects and um, and it's it's referred to as a psychic state uh, of of fusion in which we perceive um, the advanceness or how time advances and how change takes place. Uh, so this duration is space, uh, spatially and temporally, but how it takes place and uh, how objects, even though there's some um, uh, uh, stability, that there's also uh, this notion of, of change. And this, in fact, enriches um, us uh, to then um, uh, to go beyond um, the material. So it, it enriches us to go beyond matter and perceive that in fact, um, there is change um, that takes place from objects, be they objects of sense or be they objects of the mind within the mind. Uh, this is not yet intuition. Um, it's just pure essay. And uh, it is uh, not, um, uh, we, we're trying here to get beyond um, the purely, uh, I won't even say perceptual because perceptual it does include, uh, inter pardon me, interpretation, but it goes beyond existence. Um, and um, so, uh, but again, it, it has some, uh, it, it's, it's somewhat subjective still, so it can't really be considered to, uh, it doesn't qualify as an intuition, because for, um, for Maritain, intuitions um, are uh, objective, it's what he refers to as objective intellection. And um, the second level uh, from Heidegger is anguish. And so anguish is obviously, um, we are what trying to do is, uh, he doesn't say this directly, but is extracting the self as much as possible, putting the self out of the way uh, when we consider it's um, it's nearly metaphysical, but um, not, and it's a sudden state, he says, um, of keen um, las laceratory feelings in some case. That's why it's referred to as anguish because it's fairly extreme from his, uh, so that um, thought uh, must uh, be divested of the physical as much as possible so that we can receive the, the light. And that at this point, the reason it's so um, sudden and uh, lacerating and keen, um, so that notion of vividness, it doesn't need to be uh, visual, uh, so that we don't become lulled by uh, our habits and what we think and by the self, uh, so that we can, in fact, be open to what he refers to being saved from nothingness. And he doesn't entirely define saved from nothingness, um, but it's from a lack of openness of chain for, 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 for re the real to come in uh, for um, what, what Peirce would consider at least the real. Um, and um, so um, 
it, it's a, a fascinating way of, I think, dramatizing, if you will, um, this, this spiritual uh, self-based removal or divestment uh, there. And then the last level, he said it's partially taken from Marcel, is um, a, a, um, a deepening of um, morality. And so it considers, again, because we've got put self aside a bit, we can then consider, can consider fidelity and fidelity um, to ethical concepts, fidelity uh, to um, going beyond just a law for law's sake, but fidelity to it in, in understanding uh, not necessarily the law only, but new ways of um, treating others and, and so forth. Um, so, uh, and then, so for Maritain, fidelity is uh, steadfastness. So there has to be, even though there's some change, and we saw that in the last uh, step, uh, the step before this, um, we, we have to be open uh, to change in an objective realist um, enterprise. And so, um, uh, um, let's see, uh, dominating the flux is what he says of my life. So in dominating, it's like Peirce's notion of self-control in some ways, but uh, the flux um, of uh, my, my, Maritain's life, um, he's able to see uh, more objectively the truths um, that he perceives that God has to bear. So this is um, a continuity-based perspective uh, from uh, you know, similar to Peirce, but it sort of goes beyond that uh, to in, you know, incorporate the issue of um, the spiritual issue that the source for the objective light is God. And um, it, it mentions though that this level, this the fidelity level is, um, it doesn't qualify yet as intuition because there's no explanatory value or no explanatory component, pardon me, <clears throat> to um, the, um, the, 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 um, the activity of change or to the consistency. Okay, so that I found to be uh, very uh, illustrative of um, Nakitan's perspective. Um, that's not where I'm going to leave it all together. Um, and uh, so if we look at table, uh, the table that I had up 1.1, um, we, uh, I sort of went through uh, the first uh, two sections, uh, although I didn't focus in- Table the, open seminar of semiotics, merit and periscope. First, um, the issue of um, habit change um, and um, the notion of, again, receipt of this um, experience of double consciousness in um, uh, habit change and virtual habit change. So the issue of, um, and, and I have some, I'm not gonna read all of these, but um, the um, from MS um, uh, 620, uh, 1909 from his later work, uh, he talks about virtual habit as being more critical and more influential and more useful because again, it, it's not a habit yet, it comes in and uh, it can come in as an intuition, it often does. Uh, whether an intuition is tantamount to an abduction, I would say no, because the intuition really doesn't 
um, uh, hearken to the issue of, nor is it necessarily retroductive. It doesn't take the um, the, the um, consequence first into consideration necessarily uh, at, at this uh, necessarily, it, it can. But the, the interesting example that Peirce supplies uh, for virtual habit is that he really uh, thought he felt a touch from Adams Milton, or, or, or I'm sorry, Adams Milton nearly felt a touch and he thought it was a touch, but it wasn't, and the touch from God, that is. And so, um, independent of whether it's an actual touch, um, it had the same, if not more, effect because it was so novel, um, which really <clears throat> comes down to the issue of uh, in intuition, because again, it's a form of uh, index that is bound into um, and, 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 um, and into uh, fields of secondness and um, how the something comes to us as a surprise, namely in this case, a touch that really wasn't a touch, okay? So for us in the mind, um, it had that effect, okay? Um, so uh, going, um, beyond um, the, those issues, um, I, I wanted to just um, mention, since some of you have had a taste of uh, both of these uh, uh, fo foci, uh, the foci of purse and, <clears throat> pardon me, and, and um, Marquetin, um, that I, I'm gonna make the claim that there is a certain amount, as I, I say, of, of firstness and uh, obviously phenomenology that's um, integral to both of the notions of, of, of intuition. And that is that, again, it doesn't need to be real to have an effect, a real in the sense of actual, sorry. Um, and uh, it, uh, it can, the, the experience of intuition um, can bring about um, uh, thirdnesses uh, in, in the sense of reforming um, uh, our thought. Uh, but again, it's fallible. We know that uh, from Peirce's perspective. Um, and uh, it is, um, you know, a, it's not really a hypothesis, it's a premise, and it, it can be some form of hallucination, right? And for Peirce, he talks about that in EP2, 192, how um, there is um, a, uh, he talks about a, a painter who uh, has um, saw, uh, he changed the backdrop to a picture that uh, he was painting all of a sudden. Uh, and he said it's because he sees the picture over and against the backdrop in his mind. And uh, he either he likes it or he doesn't. Um, and so he made the change very suddenly of the backdrop that is the curtain. Um, and um, so uh, the the, the issue of, and, and in some cases, that's a very creative effort. And in other cases, there are these intuitions um, that are in fact um, not objective um, and they are um, hallucinatory uh, and they are, um, you know, again, not, not objective and don't have any validity. Um, and so um, he refers to these as obsessional hallucinations and, and social hallucinations, which can really uh, encompass the issue of gossip. Um, they are hallucinatory and they are. Um, so um, what I'd like to do is look at quickly uh, the next table that is 2.1, it's on issues of eidetic 
visualization uh, for table one uh, uniform. And this is Microsoft Word doc. alone. Um, <clears throat> pardon me. And uh, the issue of um, um, let's see here. Um, the issue of uh, physical abstraction, um, quantitative abstraction, and um, metaphysical abstraction. And so uh, these are sort of steps. And whether a person can skip those steps, I think he indicates that you cannot. Um, from um, You certainly can't uh, scramble them in terms of um, uh, which comes uh, before which. And then, uh, so uh, uh, these, uh, the uh, physical abstractions includes uh, some uh, apprehension of, of the thing um, and, um, and a, a global, in some cases, undifferentiated uh, feeling that goes with it. We talk about phenomenological and uh, I think it's uh, uh, Short um, who mentions this notion of phenomenological secondness for first. And I would say that in the case of, um, of Maritain, uh, it may in fact end up as perhaps phenomenological thirdness, uh, which is kind of an interesting, I've never heard it coined, but we'll see. Um, and and we'll, we'll talk about this. There are no uh, real judgments at this stage. It's just uh, empirical and existential. Um, and um, <clears throat> pardon me. And then quantitative abstraction, which includes uh, additional, well, it says uh, being uh, of the object. So in terms of being of the object, it's not just uh, necessarily a single object. Um, we take um, both the material and the immaterial, and we're not focused only on um, external attributes of uh, the object, those that we can observe through the senses, but over time, what are the common um, material um, uh, attributes or characteristics or properties of the object, which can uh, um, be seen as, uh, again, something durative over time that we were talking about before that, that Bergson mentions. Um, but uh, the notion of, um, of, of, of what objects share, if you would, so that we can at least form concepts in the quantitative, through quantitative analysis of some type. And then metaphysical analysis, of course, brings in the issue of divesting, as we mentioned before, divesting one's self from the material, and then also divesting the self in some ways from uh, our own perceptions and considering uh, what in fact is is ethical, going beyond the sense sensible, uh, and he mentions being as such, and being as such is um, being that is um, uh, uh, something that doesn't ever change. So when he refers to being as such, it's something that is in fact divine, spiritual, that never changes. Um, and, and to attempt to find that um, is, uh, is, is a critical thing. And it's something that is uh, found uh, by um, the light of uh, divine intervention, if you will. But we have to prepare for that divine intervention, as we talked about before, by, uh, by the divestment, okay? And um, so um, uh, I just, uh, I want, what I want to do is uh, now think about 
this notion of divestment um, and how intuition then receiving the types of intuitions which Maritain um, elevates and they are um, intellectual intuitions, but they come from, again, a divine source, not from uh, some self. So they are what he refers to as um, uh, supra-subjective. And I know John Dealey uses the term supra-subjective on many occasions um, in, in some of his, um, I know I've quoted um, those. Uh, so what I'd like to um, sort of wind up or down with, it may take a little, little doing, it's, uh, is the issue I don't have, it's gone. Right. Okay, the issue of um, how it is that Maritain is not a mystic, really, but a semiotician. He talks in the um, degrees of knowledge. Um, again, um, I uh, have that incorrect on there. It should be 1934, and, and the English, the first English version is in 59. Um, but uh, on uh, the version that I have, uh, the page number is 124. And um, he talks about how um, the vicar of the sign uh, is instrumental in showing us what the object has to say. And uh, it, it does that. What, first of all, what is a vicar? A vicar uh, for Maritain especially uh, would consider the uh, how uh, the, the vicars of the Catholic Church from the fourth, uh, at least through the eighth century, how they represented the Pope and even the bishops today are representatives and they're substitutes. So they're considered to be substitutes in the church. Um, and um, so for him, for Maritain, to refer to um, a sign as a vicar of the object is really um, very, um, it, it, it shows um, his, uh, his semiotic, um, uh, that, that he does understand um, the, uh, the, the, the representative nature of the sign and how critical that is. And so I'll, I'll just um, read some portion of this uh, from uh, at the bottom of page uh, 125. And that is <clears throat> representative forms are formally and purely vicars of the object. And then he has a comma. Uh, pure likenesses of objects or of the object. In the soul, they, uh, meaning the vicars of the, uh, they are the object itself. So signs are the object itself in the soul, divested of its proper existence, okay? So they're divested of proper existence when the, the object is, is um, in the soul uh, and the sign uh, and, made, um, and made present. So the objects are made present uh, by the vicar, by the sign uh, in, uh, the, in, in an immaterial way. Uh, and an intentional state. So it, uh, there is a, it, an immaterial nature to the object that is um, independent of, of whether the object is mental or physical. And uh, it's 
intentional that a person puts themselves through the stages that I talked about. Some of that is intentional to put yourself into what he refers to as like a silent state to get rid of the self uh, to some degree, put the self aside, not really to get rid of, I should say, uh, and um, enter this, what he refers to as in, in, in the same, on the same page, suprasubjective. So this suprasubjectivity, he says, is a union. Um, and then he says a union of becoming the other, one becoming the other intentionally. So that is the essence. So one, meaning the sign, becomes the object, and the object becomes the sign intentionally. Okay, And so um, it's a, a, a fascinating, and I think uh, this, this notion of the vicar of the sign, of calling or referring to the sign as a, as a vicar is really um, fascinating. And I uh, want to now read uh, something from Peirce. It, it, it doesn't use the term vicar of the sign, but um, I, it, it refers to um, thirdness um, and um, certainly the, the vicar of the sign, the sign as a vicar, as a substitute and the sign as uh, a teacher, if you will, of the object. Uh, is, is, is critical, and I think it's very revelatory um, of the effect that the sign can have. And I, I wanted to mention the issue of even, um, this is more Delian, but uh, even in objects uh, that are physical, in physical objects, um, there is, from his perspective, a pregenerative thirdness and that is the real aspect of what those objects in the future um, uh, uh, would, uh, would bring to bear, the meanings and the effects that those objects would have or could have. Um, and so um, I'm going to just read this. And, and from Peirce, it, it isn't spiritual, and I'm not saying he's a spiritual, not really. Uh, but I'm just making the claim that um, the, the critical element of um, really first, uh, uh, firstness, thirdness, and secondness is so integral to his notion of, you know, the, the categories is so critical to his notion of, um, of, of, of um, how instinct can carry out into spheres of thirdness, that is, uh, you know, objective realism. So uh, the, he, he says in uh, 6.455, 1908, um, that the third universe comprises everything whose being consists in, um, uh, I'm sorry, in, in, in an active power to establish connections. And so this notion of establishing connections, which we talked about um, in terms of even double consciousness um, or the connection of sign to object with index, uh, which is more obvious uh, sometimes than the, than the connection uh, between sign and object in, in other uses. Uh, so he, he says, uh, establishes the, the connections between um, different objects. Okay. And um, also, um, uh, especially between objects of different universes. And so again, the different universes is, is, is critical in terms of different times and different places. Um, and, and, and making those, um, the, the essence of signhood is, is this, um, this um, connection, if you will, uh, between 
objects in the same and in different universes, however one defines universes in time and place. And then he says, follows with, such is everything which is essentially a sign. Okay, these connections between objects of different universes is essentially what a, a sign is in its very essence. Um, not the mere body of the sign. So not the sign, not the representamen, uh, not the body of the sign, but the sign's soul. And he follows that up. Uh, he says, so to speak, the sign's soul, uh, which um, has the power of the, no, which in its, in its own being, has the power uh, to, uh, to serve as an intermediary between itself and uh, it, sorry, an intermediary between its object and a mind. And so whatever has the power in its being to be an intermediary, to connect, if you will, to uh, be the, uh, uh, the index, if you will, the relation, because index is, 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 is heavily based on relations uh, between its object and the mind is critical because of the issue of, 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 of uh, finding new meanings and building them in, in terms of semiosis. And so um, I, I leave you with those thoughts and uh, I hope that uh, it was, uh, um, it was uh, something that will, uh, will uh, be considered uh, and, 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 and help in terms of the whole notion of, of, of how Nakitin is in fact, uh, a semiotician at heart, and um, and and certainly are not all that different from Peirce, although certainly there are some differences uh, that I outlined. And I thank you very much. Appreciate it. Your screen share has been stopped. Thank you very much, Dr. West, for this uh, brilliant lecture, um, and. Um, I would like uh, to give a word to our commentator, Dr. Michael Raposa, but uh, before that, uh, again, a few words uh, of introduction. Uh, Dr. Michael Raposa is a member of the Department of Religion Studies at Ley University since 1950, uh, 1985. Uh, he has served uh, as chair of the department on four separate occasions. From 2006 to 2008, he also served as associate dean for undergraduate programs in the College of Arts and Sciences. Previously, Dr. Raposa taught uh, for four years at Sacred Heart University in Fairfield, Connecticut. His primary um, research and teaching interests fall within the areas of modern Western religious thought and the philosophy of religion. Uh, Dr. Raposa regularly teaches uh, courses in the philosophy of religion, contemporary theology, Roman Catholic studies. American religious history and the relationship between religion, science, and technology. Uh, Dr. Raposa is the author of numerous monographs on various topics, such as uh, the religious dimension of uh, Charles Peirce's philosophy, the religious uh, significance of boredom, the relationship between meditation and the mil uh, martial arts. Uh, among his most uh, recent publications, there is a 2020 book uh, entitled uh, Thought Semiotic, Religion, Reading and the Gift of Meaning, uh, which is uh, an, an application of uh, Peirce's semiotic theory to certain issues of uh, philosophical theology. Thank you very much, Dr. Raposa.
it's a great pleasure and uh, honor for us to feature your commentary today. Please, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Can, can everyone hear me okay? Good. I'm going to read um, my response to Donna. It, it won't take very long. And in doing so, I'll repeat some things she already said, but that will just provide evidence for Persis' claims about the continuity of mind. Um, it's an extraordinary honor and pleasure to be able to offer a brief response to Donna West's characteristically illuminating analysis of Peirce and Maritain this afternoon. As I indicated to Donna in our previous communications, while I have invested a considerable amount of time in trying to make sense out of Peirce's philosophy, I do not pretend to have any special expertise when it comes to understanding Maritain. I think that I understand him just well enough, however, to appreciate what Donna is trying to accomplish in her comparison of these two thinkers, as that comparison is embodied both in her remarks here today and in an important article published in 2019. Scheduled within this year-long series of seminars devoted to the memory of John Dealey, her topic is an especially appropriate one. Charles Peirce's impact on Dealey's thought was significant and explicit. Dealey's relationship to Jacques Maritain was personal as well as professional and intellectual. Placing these two important philosophers in conversation represents an ideal strategy for honoring Dealey's memory. So I want to begin by thanking Donna West for her important intellectual contribution, also by thanking the individuals responsible for organizing and sustaining this ongoing seminar. I very much appreciate the invitation to participate. Donna is aware of the medical challenges that I have been wrestling with during the first half of this year, so I'm confident she will forgive the brevity of my response. Her analysis is carefully detailed and comprehensive. My intention with these remarks is to focus on just a few key issues that I judge to be of special significance painting with much broader strokes. It bears noting at the outset, as Donna already has, that any comparative analysis of Peirce's and Maritain's theories of intuition would seem to be undermined almost immediately by Peirce's rather emphatic claim that there is no such thing as intuition. I am referring here to his declaration, appearing in the Journal of Speculative Philosophy in 1868, that I quote, we have no power of intuition, but every cognition is determined by previous cognitions." End of quotation. This is an early version of Peirce's well-known and often repeated claim about the ubiquity of inference in human experience. All experience is always already interpreted in Peirce's view, a form of semiosis, so that even our sense perceptions are mediated by thought signs, that is by previous cognitions. Without elaborating on the point, I can only observe that this is one very specific sense of what the word intuition has been taken to mean in the history of Western philosophy. Peirce himself admitted that the word could be and has been understood differently, as it was in the case of certain medieval philosophers who contrasted intuition with abstraction as different modes of cognition or awareness. Unlike the first meaning, Peirce does not regard the latter conception as being problematic. For present purposes, I think that Donna is correct in her judgment that much of Peirce's talk about instinct resonates with what Maritain had to say about intuition. Maritain's account of the intuition of being has itself proven to be somewhat controversial. Commentators have traced the roots of that account more typically to the influence of Henri Bergson than to Thomas Aquinas, a connection that Maritain himself acknowledged, even as he was concerned to distinguish his own position from that of his distinguished French predecessor. I'm not gonna take up any of these fine points of interpretation today in my discussion of either Peirce or Maritain. My focus will remain on comparative issues on how both thinkers understood a kind of phenomenon 
that can be labeled as intuition with proper clarification, and one that both men acknowledge as being of the utmost importance. Indeed, for Maritam, there can be no such thing as metaphysics without the intuition of being. Like intuition, the concept of being can be understood as having several different meanings. But insofar as, the, as it is the object of metaphysical reflection, and here I quote, it is real being in all the purity and amplitude of its own proper intelligibility or of its own proper mystery. This being is murmured in things and in all things, things utter it to the intellect, end of quotation. Yet despite this soft murmuring of being, originating from deep within the bosom of everything that exists, not everyone is prepared to hear it. Here is why, where I want to locate a potentially fascinating point of comparison between Maritain and Charles Peirce. And, and this moves quickly to territory that Donna has already explored in her presentation and in her article. Donna notes the importance of preparation for intuition in Maritain's account. Only those who have ears to hear will be enabled to grasp intuitively the pure being of things. This is not something that just happens accidentally, but rather it requires a kind of metaphysical training. Following leads from Bergson, Heidegger, and Gabriel Marcel, Marita identifies the experience of duration, the experience of anguish, and the deepening of a sense of fidelity as three key, what he calls approaches to such an intuition. His discussion of these preparatory exercises is more suggestive than it is definitive, but following Donna West's lead, I consider that discussion to be noteworthy. She observes how, and now I quote Donna, the subject's voice must be cauterized from all presumptions, such that one's being does not miss the voice of the intuition by dependence on subjective factors. That's a quotation from her 2019 article on Peirce and Maritain. It seems to me that Peirce himself was also preoccupied with the task of preparation in order for anyone to be properly disposed for making productive hypothetical inferences, especially insofar as they take the form of perceptual judgments. He uses a visual rather than an auditory metaphor when he remarks that things which stand before us and stare us in the face are not always easily or readily discerned. The goal of discernment is a flash of abductive insight that much like the intuition of being may seem sudden and singular in its occurrence. But this suddenness belies the extended preparation that may be required in order for such an insight to become possible. Peirce's treatment of this topic is only slightly more detailed than Maritain's. I'm thinking of two different discussions that I have argued elsewhere are related and need to be read intertextually. The first, Peirce's account of the type of training or skill development that is necessary in order for anyone to engage productively in the sort of inquiry that he identified as phanoroscopy, his word for phenomenology. The second, his prescription for amusement as an exercise that can best facilitate the abductive insight concerning God's reality. In the latter case, Peirce is explicit in his insistence that what such an exercise accomplishes is the laying bare of a certain naturally instinctive tendency to contemplate and then embrace the God hypothesis, a clearing away of obstacles in the form of various practical projects and purposes that might otherwise prevent its emergence into what must become the free play of inquiry. The intuition of being is a distinctive habit of mind for Maritain, as West makes clear in her careful review of his thought. But once such a habit is developed by means of the type of preparation that he described, it exposes a natural affinity between the human mind and real being in the purity of what Maritain called its proper intelligibility. On his view, and here I quote Maritain again, 
there is a priority in the order of nature of the intuition of being as being over the internal habitus of the metaphysician. End of quotation. So too, I think that Perth would want to classify both training for phenomenological inquiry and the practice of, practice of amusement as exercises in habit formation. Nevertheless, once such a habit has been developed, something natural and instinctive is liberated for the purpose of facilitating discernment. The human mind having evolved continuously under the influence of what Peirce perceived as nature's energizing reasonableness is in some vague sense always already attuned to what nature might actually reveal. For both Peirce and Marita, it seems to me, philosophical inquiry is different from, but nevertheless continuous with, certain spiritual practices in which human beings have historically engaged. I have previously and often made the argument that purse ought to be read in this fashion. I suspect that it would be even easier to make such a case for Maritain. There is no one specific form that all such exercises must take. Exposing oneself to anguish is different from entering into the play of amusement, but they all do seem to share a distinctive logic, a logic of self-forgetfulness that allows someone thus engaged to break the hold of whatever temporary urgency or practical concern may presently be shaping her thinking and perceptions. The disciplined formation of a certain distinctive habit of mind, vital for the purpose of facilitating either abductive insight or the intuition of being, involves a deliberate shaping of the way in which persons pay attention. Indeed, I want to argue that such a habit is best to be conceived essentially as a habit of attention, a meta habit that once formed can dramatically influence other habits of thought, feeling, perception, and behavior. No one has written with greater insight than Donna has about the role played by the type of sign that Peirce called an index in first drawing and then directing the, the attention of its interpreters. As I read her account, eidetic visualization is intended to play a, a comparable role to the index within the context of Maritain's philosophy. But I must confess I have struggled to, in trying to think through this possible connection with perfect clarity. Donna's analysis cuts to the heart of the matter when she works to elucidate how each of these thinkers explore what Peirce called the thirdness manifested in human experience. This label is one that Peirce invented, but the concept itself was hardly unfamiliar to Maritain, who in his own writing about language and symbol clearly and carefully examined its significance. While other animal species certainly make use of signs and symbols, Maritain observed the special capacity that humans display beginning in childhood with and these are now Donna's words, her gloss on Maritain, the emergence of metacognitive awareness so that deliberation on the idea can become a regular practice. End of quotation. This is similar to what occurred when Helen Keller acquired language, no longer simply responding to various signs and symbols perceived as a stimulus, but now recognizing, recognizing each sign precisely as a sign. West quotes Maritain's description of how this begins to happen for the child when instead of immediately making practical use of some signifier, and here now is the quotation, he toys with it, even in the absence of the real need to which it corresponds. So that the very idea of the thing as a sign is allowed to emerge. The resonance, end of quotation, the resonance of this way of talking about childlike playfulness with Peirce's portrayal of the pure play of amusement as a toying with things that exposes their character as signs seems too obvious to need, to need reinforcement from me with argument. It is by stepping back from ordinary practices and purposes to repeat Donna's powerful expression of the point 
by being cauterized from all presumptions that one is able to enter the potentially playful space of metasemiosis. Donna's comparative analysis is most illuminating and effective when she follows both Peirce and Maritain into that space. In Peirce's terminology, the universe of experience that corresponds to what he called thirdness. We typically move about and function effectively in a world filled with things, but Marita was vigilant in his observation that while often unrecognized, and here I quote one last time, being superabounds everywhere, it scatters its gifts and fruits in profusion, end of quotation. Now to perceive a thing no longer simply as a thing, but also as a gift is always already to perceive it as a sign, a gift, and so the sign of a giver. This observation had explicitly religious significance for both Peirce and Maritain. Donna is not preoccupied in her own investigation with topics in the philosophy of religion, but for anyone looking to move down that path, her work is most certainly invaluable. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Raposa, for this really enlightening. Currently unmuted. Hold what? Please, Dr. West, if you want to say a few words. Well, thank the you. Host has thank you, Michael, uh, for all of your energy and your own intuitions regarding intuition. And uh, I, I appreciate um, highlighting, uh, especially the um, differences and similarities that exist between these two thinkers, and especially the issue of amusement, which I knew you would broach <laughs> um, in, in this regard. And um, I, I, um, I, I, I don't. Uh, I appreciate the accolades, but I'm sure I don't deserve them. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, and um, I would like uh, now to announce to those who are watching us on the YouTube that we will uh, be closing the broadcast. But here on Zoom, uh, the session will continue and uh, uh, everyone who has uh, a comment or a question uh, is welcome.